Okay, we're going to get started. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to the Computer Aided Design session. My name is Doug Densmore. I'm a postdoc at UC Berkeley. I'm in electrical engineering, and I'm traditionally in CAD for VLSI, so I'm here kind of as an observer listening to these talks and learning about the differences and comparisons between CAD in the electronic industry and CAD for synthetic biology, so it's really exciting sessions for me. So we're going to have three speakers. Our first is going to be Deepak Chandran from the University of Washington. He's filling in for Herbert Sauro, and he'll be talking about simulation tools. Then we'll have Chuan uh, Chang from National Yang Ming University, who's going to talk about genome CAD, computer-aided whole genome design. Then we'll have John Barnford from here, from the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, and he'll be talking about a novel metabolic pathway optimization method. So we'll get started with Deepak. All right. Thank you, Doug. So um, Herbert asked me to apologize for not being able to come here. It's because the schedule got moved, and he had to uh, book his flight early to uh, reach his class Monday morning. So I'm uh, Herbert's graduate student, and uh, I know most of the material because it's my own work, most of what I'll be presenting. Yeah, so I hope I know most of it. <laughs> So uh, the general title is Simulation Tools for uh, Synthetic Biology. By the way, the, we, uh, Herbert and myself, were in University of Washington, Seattle. I forgot to put that there. So uh, I would like to start with a very simple, uh, naive analogy of you know what the ultimate goal of synthetic biology is. Uh, so there's a classical engineering example. You know, uh, this a common high school project where you have to build a truss bridge using wooden sticks and then you know, build, minimize the weight, but optimize the, uh, the stress that it can hold. So uh, there's a, you know, an objective, and you're given all the information, such as the lengths and the weights of the sticks, and you know the force equations and things like that. So the obvious thing you would do is you wouldn't try, you know, 100 different bridges and see which one is the best. You, you Usually, if you know, you know, well, I'm sure everybody, if they know the physics, they know the weights, they know the information, you would probably model this somehow and then try to optimize the things. You know, you would simulate it. That's commonly done in engineering. It's sort of almost common sense. And there's various analysis you can do. You know, you can look at time core simulation. You can look at bifurcation analysis, classical uh, dynamical systems analysis, optimize uh, sensitivity analysis. There's, you know, various analysis available. But now if you want to move this analogy to biology, it's uh, slightly different because the, the exact equations that determine the, uh, you know, the physics of the system are not very well understood. The weights, the, you know, the lengths, things like that are not known. Uh, the uh, system which our, so you know, if you build a synthetic biological system, the exact way in which it interacts with the cell, so here in this analogy, that's sort of like the table. Things like that aren't really known. You don't know exactly how much noise there is. And then it's an open question whether, you know, whether what I showed earlier, whether that's actually useful, whether if you simulate the system without knowing the exact principles that govern the system, whether that simulation has meaning. And I don't really know the answer for this, but I think it's worth, you know, at least attempting, try to model the system and then see what works. It's not, I think, it's not the correct approach just to say, oh, we don't know all the things, so let's not even try modeling this. So I leave that as a, you know, an open question, whether it's actually what's the level of precision that we can get by simulation or mathematical analysis of systems, but of biological systems when all the information isn't known. So that's just to bring things into perspective. Um, so the work I'll be uh, basically presenting is first I'll go over uh, if you need a, for a simulation, I'll go over some of the requirements for a simulation tool or an analysis tool for synthetic biology. You know, an ideal analysis tool for synthetic biology should have a few requirements. And then I'll go over how we have tried to meet those requirements. Why we, I mean, Herbert Sorrell Lab. So first of all, uh, any engineering, you know, if you want to simulate something and build it, you should have a very good understanding of the system. If you're just analyzing it just for qualitative analysis, such as if you're looking at you know, what happens when two genes regulate each other, if you're just looking for the qualitative behavior, you may not need to know all the details. But if you're going to actually build it, 
you should have a thorough understanding, an accurate understanding of the system, of how, you know, this is a simple vice table system. Not only should you know how this system behaves by itself, but you should also have some idea. If you want to model accurately what it does in a cell, you should have some idea of the load that it has on the cell or uh, how it interacts with other variable, how it changes the uh, system behavior. Because after all, synthetic biology is engineering. So you need to be practical, not just ideal. Um, so that's the first requirement. The first requirement is that the modeling, in, while uh, if you're just modeling a system to look at its qualitative behavior, you can ignore many things. It's the, I'll bring up an, another analogy. It's like, suppose you're modeling a rocket. Sometimes you can ignore air resistance. But if you're going to build a rocket, you better take air resistance into consideration. You know, It may not work if you ignore air resistance. So the first requirement is that the model modeling paradigm that you use for synthetic biology should not be based on what you think, but it should be based on what the evidence is. So it should you know, match the evidence. It should match the experimental evidence. So if the experimental evidence matches a particular type of model, that's the suitable model. It's not, the, you know, it's not people's opinion that determines what sort of model that you're going to use. It's the experimental evidence. So the modeling scheme should be flexible. The software should support flexible modeling scheme in order to adjust to our understanding of the uh, mechanism that govern a biological system. So that's the first requirement. And the second requirement is, um, so I'll, I'll, the next slide is the second requirement. But this, uh, suppose you have a system that you analyzed well. And if you want to actually build a system using known parts, then uh, there are, you need, first of all, you need information about known parts. You know, what parts are available, what parts do what, what's the, uh, you know, kinetics of the parts that will be suitable for my system. So the second requirement is that a, um, a software that, that analyzes, an analysis software for synthetic biology should not just be able to understand the system, but it should also support some sort of database of components or parts. And it should be able to integrate them into a, into a you know, complete model, a realistic model that can then be built. So if you have all those requirements, uh, you get this nice uh, pipeline for building synthetic systems. So this is how you know, a, an ideal software would make the whole process easier. First, you come up with an idea. You know, you just dream up an idea. And then you construct that model, just a simple model, just ideal. And then you can analyze it, optimize the parameters to see you know, what suits you, how, what's the idea that you had in mind. And then if you have this uh, database of parts, then you can look at that database and then fill in the, uh, the components of your model with known parts. And then you can sort of go through the cycle and then optimize your model using known parts. And then if all your modeling is, you know, hopefully accurate, if it, if it reflects the actual system, then hopefully when you build it, it'll be close to what you had intended. Um, so, that's a, so that was my second requirement. And now the last requirement is uh, modularity. So in any en engineering field, if you build something, and if that's the dead end, then I think that would be the dead end of engineering because you need to be able to build on other people's work. And that is sort of required for synthetic biology as well. It's a common theme uh, that we've been seeing in this work uh, conference is if you build something, then uh, there should be some way of specifying you know, how it works, where it works, for having some sort of a spec sheet such that somebody else can take this and then not really worry about the internal details and just know the conditions where it works, the uh, parameters that are needed to make it work, and reuse it without actually knowing the details of the implementation. And uh, this concept I would like to emphasize is sort of, I think my opinion is that this concept of modularity is ahead of the science currently. That's just my opinion. Because you know we don't know what happens when you connect to synthetic biology, synthetic modules. You know, if you build a genetic module and then connect it to the other, then it's not clear whether it, it'll work this way. You know, maybe when you connect one genetic module to other, another, and maybe there's a metabolic synthetic network, if you connect that here, there could be all sorts of effect. This may not behave as it did independently. So this concept is sort of, I think, ahead of the science, but still it's important to aim in that direction. So now I'll go on to um, 
what we have done in, in our lab to sort of meet those requirements. So the first software that we tried to, that we made is uh, called Athena, Here is the logo. And this is sort of an example of, and it was built with the idea of uh, being able to design modules. Not just, there's a lot of synthetic systems biology softwares where you can simulate a system. But the concept of a module is sort of new. So uh, the idea here is, well, as this picture demonstrated, so you can build a genetic network. So this is like a feed forward network. There's a byte stable switch. There's a ring oscillator, something like a repressilator. And you can make them into modules and connect them to each other. And you can simulate them individually as well as connect them to each other. And you get this. When you connect these three together, you get this uh, pulse triggered oscillator. Now, if you actually build this in a cell, I don't know if it'll work this way, but this is an ideal case. It's just demonstrating the usefulness of modularity. Three different people might have built these modules, and then the software can load in those modules, just connect them, simulate them individually or together. And then, you know, it's just to demonstrate how modules are useful. So the same software, Athena, um, so this little demo will show, this little video, will show how it uses a database. So what I'm doing here is uh, constructing a simple genetic network where you have some protein regulating this promoter. And wait, let me pause that there. So what I just did there the, is, I don't know if you saw that. What I did is I clicked the right button on this promoter, and I went to this database thing. And I said, substitute. And it brought up a list of known promoters. And these known promoters are, they're not from the registry of parts. They're from EcoPsych. So EcoPsych, it's a very large E. coli database that has a list of uh, promoters, uh, binding sites, genes, and things like that. So this program support, it has, it loads all the information from EcoPsych. That way you can click on this and substitute this with any of the known promoters in EcoPsych. So I'm going to substitute it with LAC ZYA, which is the binding site for uh, LAC I, and it loads the sequence. And now when I click substitute on this protein, it only shows me LAC I. Because I have substituted this with LAC ZYA, it says, OK, I will the program says, I will find you all the proteins that regulate this particular binding site. So it's a way of you know filtering Suppose you start with a promoter regulator, and you want the regulator to be lac -I, then it'll find the promoter that is the target for lac -I. And all this information is uh, obtained from EcoPsych, or well, Regulon DB, which is a subset of EcoPsych. So that was a quick demo of how Athena meets the database requirement of how you can support, you can have a, a simulation environment that also supports a database. Now, in order to simulate a system accurately, you need parameters such as the uh, binding, the, the Ka, the binding affinity, and dissociation association constants of like a, a transcription factor. Those are not really available in EcoPsych, and I don't know which database has information like that. So, you know, a lot of information isn't there in any databases, but it's just to demonstrate that it's using what is available. So Athena has several other features, and this is to uh, meet the third requirement, which is our first requirement, which is having a lot of, having uh, extensive modeling capability. So that was achieved by using a plugin architecture. So it, it, it's very easy to write plugins into Athena. For example, there's this Python interface. Uh, uh, there's this R interface where uh, you can, for those of you who are familiar with R, either you can open up this window and do, you can have R interact with Athena. Um, and there's this automatic transcription regulation rate determining plugin and the database plugin. So the plugins expand the functionality of Athena. That way you can you know, expand the modeling capability. Uh, but several things were missing in Athena. For example, the way it represents a, uh, a genetic circuit is purely by using the uh, fractional saturation kinetic laws, which hopefully some of you are uh, familiar with. And that assumed, that makes some assumption. Basically, the idea is there were a lot of assumptions made in the modeling. Scheme. So the modeling wasn't open enough. It was open, but not enough. It, it wasn't completely satisfactory. So um, we built this new software called Tinkercell. And there's the 
little self-replicating DNA fairy. That's the logo. Uh, and Tinkercell is essentially, in a very you know general description, basically what it is is it's a visual interface on top of libraries. So it's basically if you have a nice code that does something very impressive that is able to you know perfectly simulate a biological system, then but you don't know how to build a visual interface. All this is is, is a visual interface that can be attached to a program, right? C programs currently, but soon it'll have Java programs also. So I'll demonstrate the, oops. I'll demonstrate, okay, click. So here I'm just building a simple, uh, you could call it a metabolic network or three uh, things flow into each other. And uh, let's see. And I just simulated it. So now here's what I wanted to show you. Basically, so the simulation is performed by a C function. It's not really built into the program. I wrote a separate C function that interacts with the visual interface and simulates it. So you can write your own simulators that do whatever. So here's a little. Uh, little window where you can actually uh, write your own C functions that that get information such as, you know, you can say, uh, well, I'll show it to you here. So you can write a little C function that does analysis that is not available. So what this C function did is it simulated, it did a steady state analysis. It varied a parameter in the system and simulated the system continuously and found the steady state changes as you vary that parameter. And that feature was not available in the program. But I wrote a function that adds that functionality. And another thing I could do in the program is I can save this in a particular directory, and the program would, will automatically make that, this function into a button here. So other users can, you know, they don't need to write this whole code. They can just click that button and reuse the function that I have just written. Let's see. And then I can view the table of the simulation. So that's the basic idea. It's basically visual interface on top of programming. And here's a, another simple example. So here what I wanted to show you is um, another feature that's part of Tinkercell, which is, so here I have, I've highlighted the whole network and I've highlighted the whole, highlighted the whole network and Please ignore that. Uh, and then click on this tool called the stoichiometry tool. It shows the stoichiometric matrix of the whole network. And I can, well, I'll show that in the next slide, actually. It was just to show, you know, you can view the whole stoichiometry matrix. I'll show how that's useful in the next slide. And I'm just simulating it. It's a simple feedback oscillator. Just nice pictures. Okay, so this will demonstrate how that stoichiometry matrix is useful. So here, I have two transcription factors that are binding to this promoter, promoter regulatory region. And this promoter is, so this DNA uh, thing is what it represents is a, um, for those of you who are familiar with POPs, it's representing a POPs flow from A to B and from then B to C and then C stops the POPs flow. So there's actually a flow of you know, uh, polymerase from A to B and B to C. And then uh, these two transcription factors are binding to A. And then obviously there is currently, if you look at those two reactions and look at the stoichiometry of those reactions, it, by default the program doesn't do anything. You have two things binding, you know, it doesn't know what the stoichiometry is. But right now if you just notice what I did is I clicked on here and I clicked this button. This runs a C function. And what that C function does is, uh, so what that C function does is it actually filled in my stoichiometry table. So now the stoichiometry table actually has the full binding kinetics. So it has, this has the entire stoichiometry of D binding to A and unbinding, E binding to A and then unbinding, D binding and then E binding. It has all those events. 
And there's no way you can do that without a programming. You know, you can't do that by hand, especially if you have three things. You'll have uh, two to the power of three different reactions. So you have to have some sort of programming interface in order to handle something like that. So this is something the previous software, Athena, could not do. It could not do uh, you know, this full binding kinetics. And I'm simulating the whole thing. And there's these intermediates, j naught dot i3, and this is a stochastic simulation. So that's just to show you know, the, the capabilities that the programming side adds to the software. So that's just what I just showed you. Um, so this is you know, basically you have a network, and then you can view the stoichiometry matrix, so you can modify the model however you want, using either a program or just by hand. Uh, you can also have fractional saturation models. For example, uh, you can represent an entire promoter, RBS, gene, all the complexes as a single unit, and then modify its POPs rate, which is a, which is a particular attribute this thing has. And then you can say you know, the, the rate of uh, production of this protein is actually the POPs rate of the gene. And that's the classical uh, partial saturation method of modeling this. So it's just to show you can model it in different ways. You don't, it's not limited to a single type of modeling scheme. Um, so this I will actually, so another thing that Tinkercell has is this uh, tree of parts, which is actually loaded from a XML file, which will hopefully someday will be connected to a database. And what happens is each part in a Tinkercell has a set of attributes, which are again, again loaded from that XML file. So someday if there's a database of parts and each part has attributes such as, for example, proteins might have a sequence, um, molecular weight, you know, whatever. Any information that is needed to correctly characterize a protein for a synthetic biology system. So suppose you have a database of parts with all the attributes, then you can automatically load that in into Tinkercell. And that's what it's showing here. So when you click on this and then click on attributes, it'll show all these attributes. I will show that next. Nope, that's what I just talked about. I just, you know, a tree of attribute, a tree of uh, parts. Each part has attributes. There's also a tree of connections, and that's also loaded from an XML. I will show how that's useful. So here's the tree of parts. I'm slowly opening the tree, and it's very editable. You know, you can add new things very easily. It'll take a minute to add new items here. All you need is an icon and, a, and edit the XML file. So here I placed a, uh, a complete gene. It's treated as a single item. And then I'm adding degradation reactions. And then that's a transcription reaction. So here what I'm showing is, so I clicked on this and I clicked on this ABC. This ABC is text attributes, it's basically string attributes. Clicked on this is numerical attributes. So it shows the attributes of this particular part, this composite part. So it has a pops rate, it has length, and things like that, sequence. And then I clicked on those, looked at the stoichiometry matrix for all those reactions, and I can edit that. So here, I can actually put say that the uh, J3, which is this reaction, the rate of production of this protein, or it could be an RNA, well, currently it's a protein. The rate of production of this protein is A dot pops. A dot pops is an attribute of this thing, A. See, A dot pop, pops rate. And then I can set that pops rate to some formula. And then there I'm just changing the uh, concentrations. So basically this is demonstrating how those attributes are used. You can set those attributes, use those attributes in your model. Okay. And uh, just like Athena, which I showed earlier, Tinkercell also supports modules, but this is still under construction or under work. Uh, so this is a simple example of a module. It's, uh, it doesn't do everything that a module does in Athena, but I'll have it working in some time. And I think that concludes my talk. And this was supported by partially by Microsoft and NSF. So we have
have time for questions from the audience. Why do you have a... Oh, go. Do you see your software as developing into something that could model hundreds of different parts? Yeah. And, and then the question is, how does the time go up with the number of parts? Is that understood? Um, time for you mean simulating a system? Yeah. So the simulation that I have currently is very fast because it's, uh, um, first of all, it's multi-threaded and Another thing I've done is it compiles the sort of a programming detail, but it compiles the whole model into a C code, and then it's actually running that C code. So it's very fast. Mm -hmm. uh, the only time lag is to compile the code. So for small models, it might be slow, but as you, as you get complex models, it's reasonably fast. But I've not tested very large networks, mm -hmm. but it should be fast, I'm thinking. But it does have all the, uh, it's flexible enough to where like, you can model whole cells. And you can program anything and make it into a button. So you can do anything you can in programming with right. it. So if you had a whole cell and you know what some of the genes do, but you're going to have to build some black boxes uh, to represent unknown yeah. parts, you can do that. Right. Yeah, you can do that. Uh, yeah, I mean, it'll be open source, you know, usual academic thing. Well, one of the, one of the APIs I'm using is GPL, so the software has to be GPL. Uh, but hopefully, we might be able to make it BSD, but we, I think I can, there's a, that API, uh, so it's written in an API called QT, and so QT has GPL license and a license that you can buy. So if we buy the license, we'll make it BSD which means you can do it, do whatever you want. Currently, it'll be a GPL, and it's cross-platform, you know, which is necessary. Yeah, the other, the previous one was only for Windows, which is a big problem in the biology community. So I, I just have a quick question. So one of the things you mentioned is that some of this is kind of ahead of the science in some ways. So yeah, what, that's what, my opinion. Yeah. And so, in your opinion, what would be some of the, what are a couple things that would need to occur, and then kind of the priorities for this to become fully useful? Um, I think just scientific progress. As we understand, it, you know, I'm sure modeling physical systems wasn't accurate, at, you know, when, in the time of Newton, you know, when, <laughs> that's maybe going too back, but <laughs> That's the idea. As we understand the system, hopefully we'll be able to model it accurately. So as science progresses, modeling capabilities will become better. They'll become more useful. So it's just something that I think will just happen. And even now, I mean, many of the you can model a lot of metabolic networks quite accurately, such as I think uh, simulations of cell cycle are reasonably accurate, and glycolysis, things like that, are very accurate. It's just. Uh, I'm not sure how much detail is needed to build a synthetic system because there's so many variables. When you change the, the uh, when you introduce a new system into the cell, you know, you, there's all this load, and there's many things you should not ignore. And how to model those details is, uh, at least I'm not familiar with that. You have one more question? You, you said you wouldn't build hundreds of bridges and see which one worked. But in biology, that, that's often a good thing to do. So I wonder if you can use your approach uh, together with that kind of biological experiment to try to extract parameters sure. from, yeah. from the biology with your model. Yeah, that would be possible. I mean, like I said, uh, many of these functionalities, they're not there yet, but I can program it and just add a button to it. That was the main thing, and it's very flexible. You can just write a new function and then make it into a button. That way everybody can use it. Okay, let's thank our speaker.